We also have Ed Wilson. Ed is the Associate Dean of Engineering Engine Technology Program for DeVry University. And so we have another representation that's nationally represented in terms of providing engine technology education. And we have uh, Diana Phillips. She is the uh, Technical Education Division from Monroe Community College in Rochester, New York. And she's very involved in engineering education, including curriculum models and also reciprocal relationships with industry. And so her, uh, her viewpoint in this area is very valuable to this panel. And lastly, we have Venancio Fuentes, and he is the department chair for engineering technologies and engineering science department at County College of Morris in Randolph, New Jersey. And we're also very pleased to have him on the panel. The lead speaker today is Tom Gregory, and Tom, this is yours. I want to thank the uh, conference organizers for giving me the opportunity to uh, uh, be here today. I've learned a lot of things. I've written a lot of things down. I've revised my notes three times since 8 o'clock this morning. So let's hope I can still read them. And if I can figure this out. There we go. Um, our panel was charged with discussing uh, and addressing issues facing two-year colleges, institutions, regarding uh, recruiting students, uh, promoting engineering technology careers, and maintaining quality programs, and specifically these three questions. What are the critical issues to maintain connections between two and four year institutions? How can two and four year programs engage one another and strengthen their connections? And finally, what are your plans for growing, expanding, consolidating engineering technology programs in the coming decade? And uh, I want to give you a little background first about Penn College because that's the framework for my perspectives. And uh, first of all, we're not strictly a two year institution. Uh, we're located in Williamsport, Pennsylvania, and we were founded in 1989 as a special mission affiliate of Penn State University. And we began offering four-year degrees in 1992. And the first one was actually a construction management degree. In the uh, tradition of our historical context, our school is focused on applied technologies, including several majors specifically related to engineering technologies, and some more I'm going to talk about in a few minutes. But our emphasis has always been combining theoretical and practical knowledge and abilities with hands-on applied learning. Uh, our students are uh, often choose the college based on what they see in our laboratories and talking with faculty, and it's all focused at that hands-on learning. Uh, we're also mostly tuition-driven. We uh, have a small uh, allotment from the state that actually comes through Penn State, and so the current economy is a concern for us in terms of enrollments, but it's also a concern for us in terms of students and loans and the debt they leave uh, when they leave college. Um, we have about 6,500 students. Uh, we have 70 associate degree majors. That's the bulk of our curriculum portfolio. But we also have about 30 bachelor degree majors. And as you can see, the, uh, the, the bulk of our students are still in associate degree programs. But that uh, has changed over the, the, the last few years. Uh, more and more of them are becoming enrolled in bachelor's degree programs. Uh, we have about 310 full-time faculty. And uh, many of our baccalaureate students come from two-year majors. Uh, the process for matriculation from our own programs and from other institutions, other two-year colleges around Pennsylvania and, and New York and the contiguous states, is very easy. We, we try to make it easy for them. And in fact, this year we have about 600 uh, transfer students enrolled. These are some of the uh, curriculum uh, uh, or majors that we have that are specifically called engineering technologies. And I've listed a couple other ones there related to, uh, they're not called engineering technology programs, but the model is very similar. And you can see uh, uh, what the programs are along with some of their, their uh, enrollments and uh, uh, some of their accreditations. And we are pursuing TAC ABET accreditation for several other ones as well. The, uh, these baccalaureate degree majors are fed by students who come into the applied, uh, the uh, AAS degrees. And uh, you can see them listed there. But uh, it's very easy to matriculate from these programs into uh, our four-year programs. And the key for that transfer, the key of transfer for any institution, is clear pathways and easily obtained information. And what, when I talk to our faculty and, and my colleagues about uh, these particular questions, uh, what are the critical issues to maintain connections between two and four year programs? Uh, communications was identified over and over and over again. And those communications uh, would involve things like uh, 
new and changing technologies, uh, students' backgrounds and abilities, career opportunities, and even the opportunities for advanced education. A, a fair number of our students graduate from four-year programs and then go on to master's degree programs in different areas. And uh, that communication can be informal. Uh, it can be arranged, but uh, it could be ad hoc meetings. Uh, it could be at a, at a discipline-related conference such as this one. Uh, or even with mutually shared advisory members. Uh, we do have uh, uh, at least one faculty person from Penn State uh, serving on, on some of our advisory boards. And uh, the, I'd also like to suggest that the communications that faculty do also should be included, uh, also should include the high school faculty, and that was mentioned this morning as well. Uh, the, often the faculty, the teachers in high school and the counselors, are the, uh, the, the most direct influence on a student's career choice. And we, we try to cultivate that. And in fact, I've seen literature that said, uh, uh, that suggests that students begin forming fairly firm career aspirations as early as middle school. And I, I've also read, for example, that females typically will turn away from science and, and technical-based curriculum as early as middle school as well. And when I thought about that, I, I remember distinctly myself, that made sense to me because I remember distinctly in seventh grade trying to build electronic projects with vacuum tubes and, uh, and, and pestering my parents to, to get additions to these kits that were a subscription. Uh, but it was a lot of fun. But even at that time, my aspiration, I, I knew that I wanted to do something in technical and engineering or science or something like that. And uh, it was ironic because I spent the first 15 years of my engineering career working with vacuum tubes again. So. <laughs> um, but in talking, in, in involving the high school faculty, there's a real good chance that those students will involve, uh, will eventually matriculate to a two-year program and a four-year program, as, as we've seen at Penn College. And uh, the high school students need to see that path clearly. The high school instructors need to be aware of the articulations. They need to be aware of the cooperation that exists between two and four-year students. And uh, faculty in the two-year institutions can drive that communication because they, have, they, can, they can have good contacts with both groups, the, both the, uh, uh, the high school faculty and the uh, four-year colleges. They're in the middle and they can make the bridges. Another issue was uh, how can two and four year programs uh, engage one another and strengthen their connections? Well again, it's the issue of communications and sharing. And uh, faculty can share things as we've done with faculty from other institutions. Things like syllabi and abstracts, uh, examples of instruction. Uh, they've done annual and biannual faculty meetings. Uh, the programs can, uh, if they cooperate, can uh, strengthen each other and they can avoid duplication, which is an issue uh, that the, uh, the government agencies typically don't want to see is where you have some education in high school repeated in college and repeated in a four-year institution as well. But a synergy develops with face-to-face -face communications that's just not there with email. Uh, and you can have communication at all levels, uh, not, not just with administrative people, but with faculty in, in many different departments. And it works best just to get the faculty in a room to talk about the issues related to these programs. And, and we've done that, and we know that it works. Strong communication can build solid articulations, and that's really how I, I see the, the connections between two- and four-year institutions. We actively pursue articulations with both high schools and two-year technical schools uh, that offer programs in areas such as welding, electricity, electronics, machining, manufacturing, construction, architecture, and other technical areas. And uh, again, the key is that the articulations need to be clear. They need to be well publicized with knowledgeable people contacts at each end. I mean people contacts. Uh, one of the things we've discovered is that when people contact the school, it's very easy for them to contact the wrong place. And, and it's very important for, for people at the institution to know where to go to get information about this particular articulation or this particular program. Uh, we found that web-based or paper-based uh, transfer guides that are published on the web or published at the, the, the participating institutions work very well. And uh, it, it's helpful for students, but it's also helpful for parents because parents need to see the link as well. And, and the other factor that drives students to a particular career, besides the high school teachers, has been the parents themselves. And I know that a lot of the audiences we address at, uh, uh, when students and prospective students visit, visit the colleges are parents. And parents are often the ones to ask the questions, the students that sit 
very silent and don't say anything, but parents speak up and ask. And uh, we've also, in order to help the communication between uh, uh, institutions, particularly ones where we have articulations, we've uh, developed our own uh, uh, web-based course equivalency uh, database where students and parents and faculty and staff and anybody can go to the web and uh, click on a, uh, 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 an information form. You fill in the course number and it will tell you what the equivalent course at our institution is. So faculty and, and again, staff and anybody can, realize, can understand what, uh, uh, what courses will transfer from, from their institution to ours. And also there's a, there's a new uh, uh, effort through uh, uh, Pennsylvania Transfer and Articulation Center, a PA track, that is doing the same thing with high school articulations working through the Perkins uh, Program of Study uh, program. And uh, that will now be on the PA track system where students from high schools can find out where uh, and which colleges will accept their credits. And uh, in, in terms of uh, growing and expanding our, our, our curriculum portfolio in engineering technology, uh, I want to say that we don't grow just to grow numbers in, in college. Uh, we want to serve the business industry community, which has been very supportive of our programs. And uh, primarily, we want to make sure that we serve the students that are seeking, seeking those careers out there. Uh, I've often addressed parents in a room uh, of prospective students, and it, typically the questions they ask boil down to two. Uh, is there a job waiting for my student when they're done with the, the college, and how much is it going to cost? And uh, if you can answer those questions and show them the value of that education, uh, they're much more open to uh, uh, looking at the institution and the programs. But first of all, in order to uh, uh, strengthen the program, we need to find and cultivate qualified students. And uh, there's lots of uh, students out there in high school who reach down. There are programs that we've uh, developed and been part of. They're, they're called 2 plus 2 or 2 plus 2 plus 2. Uh, there's college and high school programs. We have one called PC Now. And uh, last year, uh, it's all dual enrollment, if you will. We're, we're, they are offering our courses in a high school environment and then matriculating to Penn College or some other college, but they're getting college credit in high school. Uh, last year, we had 152 dual enrollment students. Um, this year, we have 320 dual enrollment students, students, so that's really expanding. And those students are mostly in electronics, information technology, and plastics and polymer technology. Uh, we're pursuing that next year. We're going to try to develop programs in HVAC technology, architecture, collision repair, plastics, and welding. And uh, it, it looks to be a, a very successful program. Uh, we're tracking data for retention and graduation rates, uh, but so far uh, the students have done very well. The next thing we uh, look at in terms of developing quali uh, quality, uh, or growing the programs and, and expanding would be developing and maintaining quality programs. And in doing that, we, look, we have a critical evaluation of those programs we do offer what's needed now and what's likely to be needed in the future. And we try to be responsive to what industry needs. Uh, we typically try to maintain small class sizes, uh, and those are typically less than 20 students in a, in a class or a laboratory, and that promotes close student and faculty interactions. And that's one of the keys to retention, to keep the students in college, is to have them develop those contacts with the faculty in the programs. Um, we look for accreditation opportunities for existing programs, and we also are instituting a very meaningful program review, which will give us a critical evaluation of how we allocate our resources. We, uh, as we mentioned this morning, we have challenges with faculty. Uh, it's very important for a, a strong program to have qualified faculty. We look for industry experience. We look for academic credentials. Uh, we've hired people out of industry who've, had, who've not taught uh, anything. They, they've simply come to the Penn College to teach. Uh, they've been very successful. Students respect their industry experience. And uh, we do have a, a comprehensive staff development program to help them with their teaching capabilities. And uh, that's ongoing through the first three years of their, their service. It's a, uh, the hiring process is critical. And uh, poor faculty can ruin a program quickly, and they can ruin it for a long time. And so th we need to be very focused on who's in the classroom and what we, what we do them to help them out. Um, we need uh, <clears throat> quality facilities and equipment. 
It's a challenge to maintain state-of-the-art equipment that the students work on in the laboratories. We look for private and public funding, uh, but we also look for, uh, uh, we look for uh, help for industry. And just as an example, I mentioned on the slide before, there was a, a, a mention of a building automation technology program. Penn College received almost half a million dollars in industry donations from companies uh, such as Siemens and Johnson Control and ALC, all for equipment in the laboratory that uh, the students are now using to develop their skills related to uh, uh, building automation systems and security systems and so forth. And uh, there, it's possible to also share facilities. And I know that uh, Penn College has a relationship with the uh, Nano Fabrication Center here at Penn State. And our students have the opportunity to spend a semester at Penn State uh, taking courses through the nanofabrication technology area, and they, they will end up with an associate degree in that area. Um, and finally, we look for quality relationships with industry. We uh, seek and cultivate strong relationships with industry because they serve on our advisory boards for curriculum input. Uh, they offer scholarships for qualified students. They, of course, equipment donations, and uh, they offer visiting speakers. And most importantly, perhaps, they offer internship opportunities for our students. Uh, our students are very actively recruited. Uh, twice a year, we have career expos. And these employers are coming to the career expo looking for students to work over summers. Uh, and the internship experience not only is good for the students in terms of the hands-on uh, applied technology uh, on the job learning, but it's uh, good for the employers because it's, uh, it's a way to try them out to see if that person fits the, uh, the culture of that business. And uh, it, it's worked very well in the past, and the students and, and uh, businesses are very much in favor of that. Um, in conclusion, what I, I'd like to mention some examples that w uh, of cooperation between a two-year and four-year institution uh, that work. And we want to keep doing things like this. They're all with Penn State. And uh, that's probably a matter of geographic location than anything else, because I see the same possibilities uh, with other institutions. Uh, we have uh, just. Uh, worked on a cooperative grant with the uh, Department of Aerospace Engineering here, and it looks like we're in for a windmill or wind turbine that we can use as part of our new renewable energy technology associate degree program. Uh, as I already mentioned, the School of Industrial and Engineering Technologies has a relationship with the, uh, uh, the, the Penn State office where the nanofabrication technology courses are developed. And finally, we've had a, a, a long-term relationship in their transportation technologies uh, with, uh, we actually have a Dr. Angstrom who serves on the uh, corporate advisory, or serves on the Penn College Advisory Board for Transportation Technology. And we've had a, a, quite a number of students involved over the years with uh, automotive projects like uh, the EcoCar Next and the, Electrical, and the Electric Vehicle Institute. The students really enjoy that. They like the relationship. And uh, I think it, uh, it's good for both schools. It's good for both Penn College and Penn, and, uh, Penn State University. So, thank you very much. Tom, thank you for those comments. Now we have a few minutes for each of the panel members, and the next one is Ed Wilson from DeVry. Thank you, Dushi, and thanks for inviting me. Um, you've already heard from one of us from DeVry. Uh, I've been with uh, DeVry about 25 years but I'm known as the DeVry's boomerang, or number one boomerang employee, because I've come and gone a few times. I've been uh, back uh, 11 years continuously now, it was 98. Um, had a lot of experience with engineering technology, some industry experience, and I even uh, spent about six years on the dark side, the engineering side, uh, when I was at the University of Missouri at Rolla, now known as uh, Missouri University of Science and Technology, I believe, that changed the name after I left. Um, just a little bit about, um, a little bit more about DeVry. Obviously, we're a for-profit institution. Uh, stock is traded on the New York Stock Exchange. Uh, our latest claim to fame, and I had to remember what the <laughs> name of the corporation was, uh, we uh, kicked uh, GM off of the Fortune 500 and replaced them as a Fortune 500 member just recently. Uh, so. Uh, it is a, a fairly big business. DeVry University is part of DeVry, Inc., and I'm just going to uh, refer to that, but uh, you might uh, not know that uh, DeVry, Inc. also operates a, a medical school, and I believe we produce more 
residents than any other medical school in the country. Um, it's in the Caribbean. But anyhow, I'm going to concentrate on DeVry University. We've got uh, over 60,000 students, uh, 90 locations, including campuses and centers, university centers located in the U.S. and uh, in Calgary, um, Canada. Uh, about 4,000 or so of those are uh, our engineering technology students, biomedical engineering technology, computer engineering technology, and electronics engineering technology, baccalaureate level. Um, our programs tend to be a little longer than most. Uh, for those three engineering technology programs, we require 139 credit hours. I think ABET's minimum is 124, so uh, we do do a little bit more. Uh, all of our programs are either uh, TAC of ABET accredited or uh, new enough so that they're in, in the process. Uh, we've got four new BMET, Biomedical Engineering Technology programs, or I'm sorry, three this fall being evaluated and uh, one WET. Um, we also have, and since this panel is a two-year panel, we also have a two-year program in electronics. It's called our ECT program, Electronics and computer technology. Uh, we've got about 2,000 of those students. That is not, we have chosen not to seek TAC of ABET accreditation for that program. Uh, the math level is restricted to uh, algebra and trigonometry, uh, and we find we can do a, a good job uh, in electronics uh, without uh, going to the applied calculus. Um, that also is longer than the typical associate program. It's 71 credits. Um, do students move from one to the other? A few, but really not very many associate degree graduates go on to our uh, baccalaureates in engineering technology. Some do pursue a, uh, uh, we call a BSTM, uh, Bachelor of Science in Technical Management, uh, and move on uh, that way if they want further education. But it's basically a, a terminal degree for uh, uh, employment in the industry. Uh, we also have, uh, and this number is not exact, but I would say maybe about 1,500 students in online electronics programs. Uh, so uh, we've been doing that for a couple of years, and I, I think we had very, uh, very good uh, luck with that. Uh, quality program, students receive uh, electronic equipment uh, as part of their program, and uh, I think that's going very well too. But anyhow, uh, enough about DeVry and me. I wanted to address these three questions, and uh, the first one, um, I'll paraphrase it, uh, what are the critical issues to ensure maintenance of connections between two-year and four-year programs? So basically I'm thinking of uh, my experience mostly being with four-year programs, uh, but uh, I tried to generalize this uh, to uh, uh, other uh, two-year programs that I've visited uh, in my experience. And what I think are important, uh, these are just some ideas, some bullet points. As a person at a, a four-year institution that takes transfer students from two-year programs, I would like to see that the two-year faculty have appropriate credentials, and we've heard this before today, recent industry experience. Uh, recent, I would say, relevant industry experience. So faculty are extremely important the rigor and relevance to industry of the curriculum of the two-year institution uh, would be very important. Um, I think we ought to work hard together to try to, uh, what I would call, enhance the interface between the two-year and the four-year curricula. In other words, make it easy to transfer. Uh, we've got a, a four-year program. We don't have really a, a two plus two. As I mentioned, our associate degree graduates rarely go on uh, to be uh, engineering technology students, although they can receive some credit for that work. Uh, we do get community college transfers, transfers from other people, and uh, like to make that interface uh, uh, as smooth as possible so that they get maximum amount of credit. Um, as a two-year program, I know there aren't too many of you here that uh, run two-year programs, but um, I'd like to see you recruit students that have the math skills so that they can succeed in a four-year program. Another thing that I think would help uh, to help ensure the connections between two-year and 
four-year programs. Tom mentioned articulation agreements. I say uh, go beyond articulation agreements, and, and I think you kind of alluded to this too, Tom. Uh, when I, again, I said I was on the dark side, the engineering side at the University of Missouri at Rolla. Rolla, Missouri is uh, about uh, two hours south uh, west of St. Louis, in the middle of nowhere. Uh, but we got a lot of students, transfer students from the St. Louis Community Colleges, and our faculty worked with the community colleges to basically teach the first two years courses uh, to be identical to ours. In other words, EE 141 at the community college campus was the same as identical, same textbook, same uh, syllabus as EE 141 on the campus. So even though they were not part of the University of Missouri system, uh, we basically taught the uh, same course and uh, that made the uh, transition a lot smoother. And I would also encourage two-year programs to, to seek TAC of ABET accreditation. Most uh, programs that are TAC of ABET accredited are four-year programs and over, I've been involved uh, geez, since the 70s with uh, TAC of ABET and its predecessor. I've seen fewer and fewer two-year programs seek accreditation. A lot of it's budgetary. Uh, some of them just don't see the need, but I think, uh, at least in our case, TAC of ABET encourages quality and encourages continuous improvement of our programs, and I think that would be valuable for uh, uh, two-year programs as well. So I guess, uh, on number one, I'm sort of thinking from our perspective is taking some of these two-year students as transfers and what I would like to, s like to see and how we can uh, facilitate that uh, uh, connection. Our second question that we were supposed to address uh, would be how can these uh, programs engage each other to strengthen connections? Well, that's kind of related to the first one, I think. And of course, one would be, I mentioned the uh, uh, common courses uh, that uh, community colleges in St. Louis had uh, uh, compared to the engineering program in Rolla. Um, some other th ideas I had, how about uh, if uh, the two-year colleges are in the same general region as your uh, four-year institution, invite them to your industry advisory committee meetings. I think that would uh, help. Um, hold joint faculty meetings or just get together, maybe a, a social event or whatever, get to know these faculty at these two-year institutions. Hold uh, some common professional development sessions. Uh, maybe bring in an outsider or maybe one of the four-year people uh, could uh, provide uh, some uh, instruction for his colleagues or her colleagues at the four-year institution as well as the two-year institutions or uh, you know maybe bring someone from industry in. Um, this is a little more far-fetched maybe but it's possible. Uh, involve the two-year students in uh, the four-year uh, senior project or capstone projects if that's feasible. Uh, there are some supporting things these can do, and they certainly uh, reflect what they might uh, be asked to do in industry. And uh, if that doesn't work out, at least take the two-year students and try to get their faculty to bring them into the presentations of the uh, four-year students' uh, senior project presentations. So uh, those things, I think, would uh, help strengthen those connections. As far as some ideas for... Um, consolidating engineering technology programs in the coming decade. Um, I would say strengthen connections with the high school electronics instructors. Um, help them with, you know, I talked about helping the two-year uh, faculty. Uh, I think the high school electronics faculty would more than welcome some uh, technology updating as well. And uh, one of the things we've done at uh, DeVry Columbus uh, was invite the high school, some of the high school faculty to our IAC meetings. Let them hear what the industry has to say. And uh, so they can uh, take that back to their, their high school students. Um, when you do your high school recruitment, try to have industry partner with you, if that's possible, especially if you get good uh, IAC members. Um, Another thing uh, might be to have some sort of course in the first semester if you've got multiple engineering technology disciplines to not only expose freshman students in, in their first quarter or semester, uh, but uh, make those disciplines, whether they be mechanical or civil or electrical, electronic, whatever, make it seem exciting to them. 
Uh, let them know right away what uh, engineering technology is all about at your institution. Um, another thing I heard, I think, from Tom. <laughs> sorry, sorry, I didn't copy you, but uh, and I've heard this other, other also too. Uh, you know, it, it, it's sometimes hard to recruit a student from high school. It's a lot easier and a lot cheaper to retain that student. So work hard on, on student retention. There are all sorts of things that can work on that. But uh, it's a lot easier to keep somebody that's already there than go out and find someone uh, new that's, that's interested in your programs. Um, and then uh, uh, finally, uh, think about maybe, uh, or we should think about as an engineering technology uh, community, maybe a more general two-year curriculum. And then we branch off into the more specialized fields like civil and mechanical and electrical and so forth. So again, uh, just some ideas, food for thought. I'd uh, be more than happy to uh, answer any questions uh, that you may have uh, once we uh, finish with the presentations. Thank you. Thank you, Ed. The next speaker is uh, Diana Phillips. Diana? Good afternoon. I apologize for not being with you this morning. You saw I tried to sneak in the room uh, this afternoon to no avail. Um, thank you very much for the invitation to come and talk uh, about engineering technology. It is a subject that I feel very passionate about. I'm the Dean of Technical Education at Monroe Community College in Rochester, New York. And what I'd like to do is talk to you a little bit about that program uh, the college, the community, and then talk about some of our challenges and what we're hoping to do in the future. One of the reasons that I'm standing here before you is because um, a colleague from Rochester Institute of Technology recommended to the panel that I come and talk to you about um, engineering technology at a two-year school. Her name is Carol Richardson. Her dean is here today. He and I spent an afternoon together, most of the day actually, a few weeks ago, trying to talk about programs, what we have in common, what we can do better, and we'll talk a little bit more about that as we go along. The um, Monroe Community College is, is located in Rochester, New York. Anybody know what major company comes from that part of the country? Anything come to mind? Kodak, Xerox, Bosch & Lum, those companies dominated the landscape of Monroe County and the Metropolitan Statistical Area for many, many years. And at one time, when Kodak was at its largest, it employed almost 70,000 people across the globe. Today, that company employs less than 10,000 people. In those intervening years of declining, um, uh, the, de the decline of Kodak signaled in our community the decline of a community in some very real ways. On top of, so trying to paint a picture here, we've got Kodak declining enrollment. I've already told you Monroe Community College is in Rochester, New York. Any other institutions sort of pop into your brain that come from that part of the country? Mr. Walker, Dr. Walker, would you care to? <laughs> RIT, obviously. National prestigious institution, the University of Rochester, another prestigious institution. So we've got a confluence of uh, lots of things happening in our, in our community. Monroe Community College this semester, fall of 2009, has the highest enrollment that we've ever had, 19,250 students. 19,250 students at a community college in upstate New York. Of those 19,000 students, about 2,000 of them are in the engineering technology uh, or are in my division in technical education. My division includes four departments. Engineering technologies is one of those departments. In the Department of Engineering Technologies, we have construction, electrical engineering technology, which is ABET uh, accredited. We have manufacturing technology, mechanical technology, and we have a degree program called Optical Systems Technology, which was one of the few programs in, uh, associate's degree programs in optics in the country. 
coming from Rochester New York, it probably doesn't surprise you that we've got a degree program in optical systems technology. When I took over as dean four years ago, enrollment in the division was the low, lowest, was at its lowest point. We had less than a thousand students in the technical education division. This year, I am happy to report we have over 1,800 students in the division. It's our highest enrollment in about nine years. MCC is one of the few community colleges in New York State that did not close all of its technical programs during an intervening period of time. So from my perspective, one of the things that I want to comment on is that what we do, the, the work of the Technical Education Division, does not exist um, outside uh, in a vacuum. We exist in New York State, which has certain rules and laws that we have to follow in terms of K-12 education. We exist in a community that has experienced a significant, it's part of the Rust Belt, you've heard those terms before, had experienced a significant decline in manufacturing jobs, supposedly, over the last few years. And uh, we exist in a culture of an institution um, that is predominantly liberal arts, with a, a, a student body of 19,000 with less than 2,000 of those students involved in technical education, that sort of gives you an indication. Now, the health programs operate separately for my division, so we have a significant student population in health programs, but predominantly 75% of those 19,000 students are in liberal arts programs. Why is that? So we have an economy, um, Kodak in decline. What we actually really have, though, is a community of about 1,500 small and emerging uh, manufacturing companies in, the western, in, in our part of the country, not western New York, central New York, Finger Lakes region. One of the challenges, in the days when Kodak, Xerox, and Bosch and Lam wanted a new program at MCC, Somebody from Kodak would come over and meet with the president of MCC and they'd sit down and say, okay, we need a program, we're going to put 600 people through it, we need it operational in about six months, Here are, here's the skill sets. There were people at Kodak whose job it was to do that. That no longer exists. Now there are 1,500 companies in the area that we're trying to be responsible and responsive to. And you can understand, and, and some of those 1,500 companies aren't even, they're small companies. Uh, most of, 97% of them, of those 1,500 companies have less than 100 employees. But they are the future, they are the economic foundation and the future of the economy in our region. So we have to find a way to listen to them and reach out to them and talk to them. I call that developing reciprocal relationships with industry. And uh, we've tried to spend some time over the last few years coming up with some comprehensive a plan on how are we going to do that? How are we going to listen to um, our, uh, our community and figure out what their needs are as it relates to engineering technologies? So it's sort of a multiple level approach, I think, and we've talked, to, uh, some of our speakers have talked about that today. Certainly advisory councils are critically important. I think um, co-ops are also important, especially if my faculty are managing the co-ops that our students are out on because it gets the faculty out in industry. I, a, a new um, a program project that we started working on last summer is what we call faculty field experience. I pay the faculty to go into industry and work in industry. So instead of teaching a three credit hour course or a three FCH, we call them faculty contact hour course, that faculty member's responsibility is to be in industry for 120 hours instead of teaching a class for 120 hours. Uh, we found that to be very valuable and we're going to be doing more of that. And obviously networking and joint uh, meetings with industry is a good idea. Let's talk about the student co-ops and the faculty field experience for a minute. Um, what, I, what I envision, what we're working towards is the opportunity to have teams of faculty in industry on a regular basis, not just a one time, okay, I'm gonna go out, you know, because the dean is sort of kicking me to make me do this, but the idea is to make it part of the reward structure and to have the faculty engaged in industry just as we have the students trying to get practical experience. Um, 
if I have a team of faculty out there at different companies and then that team comes back every couple of weeks and they sit around a table having coffee talking about what their experiences are with, with the different companies that they were in, that has got to lead to a more enriching experience in our curriculum and for our students. And our faculty will understand firsthand experience on what is actually happening in industry. So I, ta I call those developing reciprocal relationships, but also we're penetrating industry on multiple levels. Yes, we have advisory councils and formal advisory meetings where they look at our curriculum, but we're also out in their companies. Our students are out in their companies and our faculty is out there as well. Um, so that we're hearing what they have to say in, uh, from different perspectives, which is going to enrich result in, if we're doing our jobs correctly, a richer experience, deeper, more comprehensive curriculum for us. So let's talk a little bit about, so that's industry that we're, or that's our community that we exist in. We've got uh, Monroe Community College. It's quite a large community college in New York State. As I've said to you, it's predominantly, it started out to be a technical institution, but it, it has evolved over the years to a predominantly liberal arts institution. And we're, um, we are a resource dependent division, obviously, technical programs. We have to have the resources, we have to have equipment, we have to have labs in order to run our programs. So, my first six months on the job as the dean, we, um, we engaged in something called the Engineering Research Task Force, and we put together an interdisciplinary group of folks, and we went from company to company to company. We took about six months, and we did sort of a qualitative research project, and we asked them, what, what are the skill sets that you're looking for from our graduates? One of my jobs when I took over as dean was to, was to advise the president, do we need all these technical education programs? Um, and part of that task force was to determine, do we need technical level programs or has the industry evolved to the point where technicians are no longer needed, in which case it was my job to go back and recommend to the president, close those programs. So we spent six months going from company to company to company, asking them what it is that you need um, when it comes to skill sets for workers. And what we found out um, was indeed they do need technical level workers. In fact, that was their greatest need was for technical level workers. And I'm sure this doesn't surprise you. They were needing technical level workers at the very time when we couldn't get students interested in our program. For, you know, they just weren't interested. They weren't connecting. We weren't connecting with them in any way. One of the things that resulted from that task force was a new curriculum model that I call uh, a, a responsive curriculum model. What we had had, and we're still evolving that model as a matter of fact, but what we had had uh, in terms of the curriculum was a model that I call was a, an industrial model based on the way Kodak did business 40 years ago. And frankly, the model didn't work for Kodak 40 years ago. It certainly was not gonna work for us in uh, now, and it was where everything was taught in separation or isolation from everything else. Uh, the ELT folks, students, didn't take any optics courses. The mechanical students didn't take any electrical courses. The optical students didn't take mechanical and electrical courses. All of our programs were taught in isolation of each other. And um, so we evolved a new curriculum model that has a core curriculum where students take, and this is all based on in, in the idea of advanced manufacturing because that's the area that we're trying to serve. So there is a core curriculum that involves, you might not be surprised, general elective requirements. Physics is certainly a requirement, but there are also some safety courses that there are in common and some fundamental language courses. Electronics is a fundamental core course or some electronics. And then we evolved specializations, so a student can specialize in electrical, mechanical, optical. Um, we're working on a new degree program called Applied Engineering, and I'll get to that in a minute. So they can take, they can specialize in those areas. 
But even in the specialized areas, what I encourage the faculty in when we're looking at curriculum is to overlap those courses, and I always say to the greatest extent possible. So if there is an optics course that the mechanical students and the electrical students ought to be in, then let's have mechanical and electrical students in that course. So that, because the technology is obliterating the boundaries. This is another conversation that we have a lot. Technology is obliterating the silos. Technology is obliterating boundaries between electrical, mechanical, optical. When I go into a company and I look at a machine that is manufacturing something, that machine has electrical parts, there's a computer running it, it has optical sensors on it, um, it is part of a manufacturing assembly. So that's what I mean about technology obliterating some of those boundaries. Specialization, then there's a co-op course included for all of our programs, we're working towards that. And then a capstone project where students are involved in design build kinds of activities. I call that a sustainable model in, um, for technical education and it has four particular characteristics. It is nimble, flexible, responsive, and sustainable. And that's what, I, and let me tell you what I mean by that. Nimble in that it can change shape quickly. As you all know, the academic world is not a world that's known for quick change and yet, Technology is changing at such a rapid pace, it's, it's just so difficult for us to hold on to the past. We have to have or find a curriculum that is nimble, that can change. And there are some components of this new model that allow for that nimbleness. By flexible, I mean it can assume different shapes. It doesn't have to look like we're building specialized courses into the curriculum that we can change the subject matter, the content of those courses from year to year because we call them special studies courses. And it enables us to take some risks from time to time and do some research and development and respond to something immediate in the industry right away. So that's the flexible nature of it. It can assume different kinds of shapes. It is responsive in that we are responding to what industry is telling us it needs. And my experience going from company to company to company for six months, the reality is if those folks would have had a crystal ball and could have looked in that crystal ball and told me what it is they needed, they would have been more than happy to do that. But they could not do that because technology in their world was changing too quickly as well. They were guessing as best they could, and we were trying to respond. And, and so the timeline becomes much more um, concentrated in that kind of format. So they're guessing at what their needs are. We're trying to listen to them and be responsive to it. And by sustainable, I simply mean that we can afford to do it. Um, as a community college, we can't afford to do everything that there needs to be done. So we have to have programs and curriculum that is affordable for us to do. So those are the components of the model. It is uh, nimble, flexible, responsive, and sustainable. So we've got, uh, we've got reciprocal relations with industries. We've got new programs, a new, a new curriculum model that we're working on. Um, we're working on a new degree program called Applied Engineering, and this was an outgrowth of our, um, uh, of our um, visits with industry. Because as I said earlier, the optics companies wanted to hire our electrical engineering technology students. The optics companies wanted to hire our tooling and machining students. Um, not surprising, the optics company needed to hire our networking technicians. Obviously, it's a company. It has a, a, a broad uh, skill uh, needs, lots of needs. <coughs> the applied engineering curriculum that we're working on now is going to test the model. It is essentially put together, there's a few electronics courses, there are some optics courses, there are some mechanical courses, there are some manufacturing technology courses. Right now, I've got the, I've got the curriculum out with industry to be critiqued. We conducted, have you all heard of DACOM, the DACOM Institute in Ohio? We brought the folks uh, to MCC in August. We had an interdivisional, interdisciplinary, intercollegiate team working with 17 representatives from industry. And their task was to help advise us with this new applied engineering curriculum. We took their advice. We put the curriculum together. The curriculum is now out in the hands of 
some industry representatives for a critique. That's its next step, that's its next test. So we're trying to test it along the way. And it will have in it, um, as I said, some electronics, some optics, some manufacturing, some mechanical. Um, it will have a co-op and a capstone, a design, build, test, capstone course, because we certainly can't forget some other things. We're talking about the globalization of manufacturing. You can't design any kind of curriculum if you don't talk about the global economy when it comes to manufacturing. So we're trying to put an awful lot in a two-year period of time, as you might imagine. <coughs> more, more to come on that as we, our, our target is to roll that degree program out fall of 2010, we'll actually start, uh, we'll actually have students in the program. One of the things that we learned from the DACOM panelists, we had, as I said, 17 folks in with us, oh, thank you, gentlemen, for two days. We had 17 people in from industry with us for two days, and they ranked from vice presidents of a small company that had less than 20 employees to one of our larger employers and very sophisticated employers in the area. And they were machine operators, they were technicians, they were vice presidents. They were all in a room. We had them captive for two days, and we picked their brains for two days. One of the most important things that came out of that session was that our curriculum needed to be project-based. So all of our courses, not just the capstone course at the end, but from the beginning. Because when our graduates actually entered industry, they were sitting around the table or they were in a um, pod in some, of, in some of the cases, but they were working on teams with other individuals and they were trying to solve problems involving manufacturing or engineering technology. And it was a project-driven environment. So it was very rewarding for us to learn that kind of thing from them, that all of our courses, and this again goes back to this model that is um, nimble and flexible and um, responsive and sustainable. <coughs> if, what we learned was if we could make it project driven, if we could join all of our first, sem uh, first semester courses into some sort of project and all of our second semester and third semester and fourth semester courses into projects, it would be more responsive curriculum. So that was another lesson that we learned and we're trying to apply that in our new degree program in applied engineering. So I've sort of set the stage. I've got um, the external environment in, in Rochester that we're working in, what's happening internal in the college. We've got some new curriculum. We've got some new processes that we're going to try to put into place. So what are my biggest challenges as the Dean of Technical Education? And I think you might not be surprised to know that it is two things. Number one, keeping the skill set of the faculty current is my biggest challenge. How do we do that? I live in an environment and work in an environment that is not only tenured, but unionized. It's a very strong union community, college. And um, the faculty, uh, this year I had the opportunity, this is my, I'm just finishing my fourth year as dean, I've had the first opportunity in four years to hire a new faculty member, and I think one of my colleagues mentioned how important it was to make sure you got the right hires. But um, if we don't change, my second problem is related to the first problem, and that is changing the reward structure internally in the college that it, it, it enables me to, enables us to um, design a reward structure that encourages the faculty to keep their skills current. And if we can't do that, I feel that we're doomed to repeat the past. In engineering technology, in these areas where, in my belief, technology is obliterating boundaries, if we can't keep the faculty engaged in that process and their own professional development and updating the curriculum as, it, as d demanded by industry, then we're going to keep, we'll have periods or pockets, I think, where we'll be relevant for a few year for a few years and then we'll fall into obsolescence again. We have to design new reward systems inside academic institutions that enable us to continuously renew. That is not something that most community colleges that I have ever worked in, we don't know how to do that very well. 
we know how to construct contracts that you know work for four years but don't take into consideration this need to constantly renew and constantly update the skill sets of the faculty. Those are my two biggest challenges. And my, I met my five minutes. So I didn't exactly answer the questions specifically, but I will say that we have excellent relationships, um, and I agree with my colleagues over here. It's, it's constantly about communication is the key to maintaining the relationships and keeping those relationships healthy and current. Thank you. Diana, thank you for these unique perspectives. The next speaker is Venencia Fuentes. Good afternoon. Um, you can also call me Benny. That's uh, the short version of it. But uh, I do have a PowerPoint presentation. And if there's any profanity in it, I apologize ahead of time because it was probably written during the fire drill. <laughs> so uh, I think I, 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 I removed most of it. But I just want to give you a little perspective on County College of Morris. Again, County College of Morris is one of the 19 community colleges in New Jersey. We're basically right off of Route 80, basically four hours east of here and about 30 miles west of the Empire State Building. So um, again, one of the 19 community colleges, we have two ABET accredited programs. Uh, first accredited back in 1988, so we, it's, they've been around a while. The Mechanical Engineering Technology Program has about 110 students. The Electronics Engineering Technology Program has about 60 students. A lot of that input is not directly from the high school. Do you have to understand, one of the, the nicest things we have is Picatinny Arsenal is the Department of Army um, one of the development centers is in our backyard. A lot of our met tech students wind up getting positions there either as a co-op and, and, and eventually permanently, all right? So that's an opportunity. So a lot of those students are either picked up in some of these manufacturing, small manufacturing facilities, they're picked up, and what they see around them are engineers. So they'll come to the local community college to basically further their education. So they're not coming directly out of high school, all right? What I want to do is kind of look at this as basically a, a SWOT of what this pipeline is. Now, when we talk about the pipeline, I would imagine we're talking about students, right? I couldn't bring a student, it wouldn't fit in a suitcase. So I brought a pen. I want you to think about the pen because I'm going to use it a couple of times symbolically to kind of frame my presentation, all right? So when we look at the strengths of a community college, and that was brought up with, um, again, open enrollment environment. And of course, that's a double-edged sword, and it'll show up as a weakness also. Technical programs, what is an associate degree program? It's really an opportunity, and at the associate level, there really is a big difference between what? Engineering technology and engineering science. And one of the things I want you to understand I am the department head for engineering technologies and engineering science. Let me frame that a little bit. I also have telecommunications. I also have aviation. I also have physics. And I also have fire science, right? And again, a lot of that, when I first started at CCM 17 years ago, we had an engineering, we had electronics engineering technology department, and that was the department I was hired into. Right, and I am the youngest faculty in my department, all right? And we had a mechanical engineering department, we had an electrical engineering department, we had an engineering science department, engineering science slash physics department. Over the years, those pro programs have combined and they're under me. If we wait a year, I'll probably have another program under me. So if I come back again at some future presentation, I may be talking about another program that I have responsibility for. And that kind of addresses one of those questions. How do we survive at the community college level? Well, we survive by hopefully not necessarily eliminating programs, but by combining them maybe under one administrative head. And historically, we also had a program called Mechatronics, all right, which was a mix of the electronics program and the mechanical program. We did away with it about three years ago because we kind of realized, and actually my outside evaluator, at least he's on the attendance sheet, was from the, one of the Penn State ca campuses, 
really pointed out something that I kind of knew in my heart the whole time. It was made up of too many first semester courses. It was made up of that first year program and really didn't make any sense. And it kind of drove it home. At one point, almost nine years ago, our president actually came out and said he was going to get rid of the electronics program, get rid of the mechanical program, and hold on to the mechatronics program. That was scary. Mechatronics program had barely three, maybe at the top, we had six students at some point in time. But the idea that this combined program would salvage us or save us really didn't make any sense because it was really being held up by all the other programs. Right? It was OK to have a mechatronic student in existing courses because that made sense. The biomedical, we have a biomedical equipment option under the electronics program. That exists, even though it's a small program, we feed the local hospitals in their clinical engineering departments. That exists because it lives within the EET program. And then it has a clinical component where the student does 200 hours in a local hospital. There's also um, the other portion, which is the biomedical equipment option. I basically do as an online course, all right, at a, at a different rating system, just to be able to run it, usually with four or five students in it, that type of thing. So again, opportunities for employment, and that's a critical thing. Like I said, that makes the difference. Typically small programs, that was brought up before, too. The maximum we can have typically in a technology lab is 18 students, all right? Programs can be adapted, and that's what I wanted to get back to the question this morning from the, uh, the member from the Society of Manufacturing Engineers. We've taken some of our, we still have a machine shop for our mechanical tech students. We've taken some of the existing courses and actually sold them both in a credit base and a non-credit base for local manufacturing firms. So some of the first year apprenticeship people that are coming into some of the local small machine shops in the area, they'll come through that program. Typically in a non-credit, they like the, the no, no exam type thing. But we're running the same material. We're just running a lot more compressed and again. So I think we're very adaptable at the two year level. We can do that. So the strengths. Going on to weakness. Again, open enrollment environment. Typically, and again, I'm not, I'm not ba backing up all my numbers, and um, I think it's more representative, but more than 60% of your students wind up in remediation. All right? Developmental courses in either writing skills or mathematics. Obviously, when you're trying to run a technology program, that, 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 that type of issue is always going to be an issue. How do you get them through the mathematics and keep them in the program? All right? Um, for the most part, again, two-year schools are seen as a fallback option. I mean, the standard joke is it's what? It's, it's super senior year for the high school, all right? Luckily, when we talk to students after they graduate from CCM, they had a great experience. They appreciate the experience, but they never got that idea while they were in high school. So part of this is really selling it to the students while they're in high school, that it's, it is a good opportunity. My son just came and graduated from CCM, and my wife and I are both engineers, and naturally our sons are not engineers, all right? Of course, that, that only makes sense. But both of them are products of CCM, and, and good products, all right? Um, so again, I know the opportunities exist. I live that experience, and I can tell parents and look them in the eye, my sons have gone through the programs here. I know the quality of the education. And if you're not familiar, actually, this brings something up. New Jersey started something about, um, unfortunately, it was under government of Grevy, and he had to, he had to exit a little bit in a, in a strange way. But um, it started up something called the STARS program. STARS program allows students at that time in the top 20% of their high school class to attend their local community college for free, and then if they wanted to, to go on and do STARS too at the local state school at a discounted rate. Since then, Covenant Corzines reframed that a little bit and made it the top 15%. Because the program is very popular. We have about, at CCM, we have about 100 students that are going through that program. My, my younger son, I took advantage of that. He was in the top, he was number five in his class. It was a hard sell to the guidance counselor to send him to CCM. All right, and that, that was just, just one of those issues. But he didn't know what he wanted to do, but he knew he didn't want to do engineering. I'm still not really sure why. But um, So again, that's definitely a weakness. 
moving on, and, and that's just a graph because I, I figured it's an engineering group. We should always throw graphs in here. And ET programs tend to yield small graduation weights, and that, that's a continuing problem. And uh, I know it because that's usually what the first thing uh, my dean will show me. We only had six graduates last year, and we got 60 students in the program. It doesn't show the students that may have gone on to a four-year school, and for one reason or another, they were short one course, and I'll tell them, hey, you know what my goal is? Is to get you on and on to your goal. If that goal is to go into a four-year school, your shorter course here, that's fine, right? If you ever take a course at the four-year school that makes sense and transfer back, that's fine too. So it goes both ways, but that's typically, it's like, let's move on. And if you're not familiar with New Jersey, there's New Jersey Institute of Technology, and actually I can blame Ron Rockland for this. He recommended that I come here today. Uh, but he's, he's the department chair at NJI, uh, NJIT, all right? And typically, again, our students, seven out of 10 from CCM will go on to NJIT and finish up the programs there. And they do very well, so that, that's always a good thing. But uh, any other thing, too, and Diane alluded to this, too, it's a high-cost program, all right, without a doubt, all right? We are not making the money the math department is making. We're not making the money the English department is making. We cost money. Over the years, I've lost three faculty members to retirements. I haven't had any replacements. And I'm still losing money, and I still haven't figured that one out. Because they keep adding this overhead to my department, and I pick up other programs, and I'm still losing money. I'm still trying to figure this out. I'm going to have to take an accounting degree one of these days to figure out what's going on. But uh, again, it's a high-cost program. I'll just kind of move on. Again, a weakness. Again, this has been beat to death today. and I, you know, I just left it in here. That difference between engineering and technology is a great confusion, and I'd love to have that fixed, and somebody alluded to it. It's been going on for 30 years. What's another two years, four years? It doesn't really matter, right? But um, again, also, what are the options past that two years? One of the greatest things I see as my fear from a two-year community college is when I send my students to look into four-year programs, and the four-year schools that have the engineering technology programs don't even understand them. The admissions people they talk to, right away they're told, oh, no, no, you can't go into engineering because you don't have chemistry. You don't have the engineering physics. You don't have all those courses. They don't even understand those programs. So if you are receiving students from two-year schools, make sure your admissions people understand. They may have a student showing up and saying the word engineering and it doesn't necessarily mean what? Engineering science. That's a critical thing. Because that's putting out more fires than I really need to do. I don't know how many times that's happened. They come back from NGIT going, I'm sorry for the videotape, but uh, basically saying they were told they have the wrong courses, they're in the wrong program. And that's not the case. So it's important, if you are receiving students from two-year schools, that your admissions people, those are the front lines that those students see, understand those programs. All right? Opportunities, again, the global opportunities. Economic troubles, again, this whole thing. I'm seeing more business majors transferring the engineering programs. All right? I mean, obviously, that's the Wall Street fallout and stuff like that. Uh, again, the chance to actually make something. Excuse me a second. Um, but again, engineering technology field seen as a good field to enter. And again, I, I, like I said before, a lot of that is coming from people are working in these jobs. So far, it's been, the economy has been semi-decent. These companies are hiring people with very little experience, and they're coming in, in to CCM basically for that retraining portion of it. All right? Uh, lower costs associated with the community colleges. And again, just a recent Star Ledger report showed the numbers were up 12.4 for the New Jersey community colleges. I actually have a colleague here from Passaic, and their number was uh, 24, 25% up in enrollment, all right? One of the community colleges went up in 30. I'd love to say that was all in engineering technology. That's not necessarily the case. But again, the whole thing about collaboration. Luckily, right now, we're working with our local Morristown High School. Uh, again, this career, technology, education type thing, and they're actually following a model that's out of the Colorado system, 
If you haven't had a chance to see something, it's all over the internet. Shift happens, all right? This whole idea about technology and the jobs and all that, it's a great piece of PowerPoint to see, all right? This whole thing about Colorado colleges focusing on the technology and everything else is what? The math and the English and all the other stuff is kind of that filler. Technology is the, is the center theme. theme. And then hopefully that's something we're going to get out of uh, the Morristown High School system. But again, you know, NFF fund, uh, NSF funding. Um, there's a lot of opportunities to do some partnership with your two-year community colleges. I think that's a great thing. Think about it. Again, if you don't do something with your community colleges now, my concern would be sometime in the future, that pipeline may not exist. Because once it kind of goes away, it really doesn't come back overnight. Again, existing curriculum and educational delivery systems. Let me go back to my pen. Referring to my pen, this is something we've been doing for years. And this is something, again, I mentioned my wife's a mechanical engineer. This was a freebie. Sometimes when we do, we talk about, when I unscrew this, again, if you think of it as a student, we can twist it to make it work, right? It becomes a functional thing. We can make it right. We can make our students do things by twisting them and stuff. But what we sometimes fail to do is realize there's knowledge inside of them. If you can't see what this is, it's a memory stick, all right? It has the capability to what? Add information. We can build on it, all right? It works with the pen, but this pen or this memory stick could be adapted to anything, right? And that's kind of what our students are. They're adaptable, as long as we what? Fill it with the right information, and as long as we tell the employers what the proper what? Thread size is, diameter, that adaptability type of part, that, that connection type of part, all right? So it's important to understand that. If we go around and try to stick this USB into a three and a half inch drive, is it gonna work? And that's a lot of times what we're trying to do with some of our curriculum. We're trying to take new students that are trying to learn in a different fashion and try to stick them into the same old system and wondering why they don't fit, why they don't work. So we need to look at some other ways to add information to this because we can connect this to a camera and get information off of it. There's all kinds of things that can add information to this. And we need to kind of look at that and understand that portion of it. Um, again, the need for TAC ABET accreditation. I'm also an evaluator. For those of us that are from six, uh, two year schools, I, and the reason I said six accidentally was there's only six of us here out of the 60 that are here. Again, I counted about four o'clock in the morning. That was during the second drill. Um, <laughs> my numbers may be off, but. Uh, that's been a recurring problem. I go on visits and I'm the only one from a two-year school. If you're from a two-year school and you don't have someone that's involved in TAC of ABET as an evaluator, you are really at a disadvantage, all right? Especially when you get visited by schools that don't understand the two-year system, all right? So again, it's not really clear, what is the advantage? Does my student from a TAC ABET program have easy access into your programs at four-year schools? We've talked a little bit about that, and it's important for people to understand that. Um, and I just want to add one last thing as I close out. I just want to add a, a quote from uh, Martin Luther King Jr. He said that time is always right to do the, what is right. And we have an opportunity right now, and, and I know Mark Pagano at last night's dinner said, hey, we have a chance to get together and talk, but then we go back to our institutions and what? We're just back to the daily grind and we forget the things we could do. Do collaboratively, all right? Do as a group and solve some of these problems. So the time is right to do something about this. All right, thank you so much. I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much, Mauricio. So we are getting into the question and answer session at this time. So we open to questions at this point. Where would you get that pen? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'll show you later. I don't want to advertise over the video. One of the, one of the takeaways that 
I'm, I'm listening to the presentations here. Was uh, Dianus was nimble, flexible, and sustainable. I cannot get my head around that, but I can. I can imagine academic academics being <laughs> nimble, flexible, and sustainable in some ways. But I also see that faculty development as a key part of this is over and over again emphasized, which is, I think, uh, an important part of the two-year degree programs, which we don't totally take it for granted in the way we, that we do faculty development, at least at the four-year and the you know, R1 institutions. So uh, I'm... I have a question for uh, Diane. Uh, I, one of the comments you made that was very interesting to me was this idea of paying faculty to work in industry. Right. Uh, how the heck did you get that approved? <laughs> we, have, um, so we have discretionary release time in my institution. My vice president, the deans, we have discretionary funds. So um, I in offered it to faculty to work in industry, we, I put a team of faculty on a sort of a little ad hoc committee and I asked them to figure out for a three credit hour course, how much time do they spend on a three credit hour course? They came back to me and said between 90 and 120 hours. I said, okay. We came up with a process. Um, I will release you from your responsibility to teach three FCH if you will go work in industry for 90 to 120 hours. Um, and these are the deliverables. We, the process, if you're interested in the process, I can tell you a little bit about that. We, um, the faculty member identifies what industry, their, what their major interest is. The faculty member and I get together and come up with a list of companies that we think might, might fulfill their interest. We go, I, uh, solicit the company and say, hey, I've got a faculty member that would like to come out and hang out with you guys for a while. What do you think? The way it works um, so far, we met with the CEO of the company. We talked about what our objectives were. We talked about what the company objectives were. We talked about what the deliverables for the faculty member would be at the end of the time period. And everybody agreed. The um, CEO uh, from the company uh, put together in, in this particular case, the way it worked out, the faculty member went out for a two-week period of time, and he was there every day for two weeks. It just didn't work out that it would be over the course of a semester, et cetera, et cetera. But they had him at every uh, department and uh, meeting that they could put him in in that two-week period of time. He met some of his former students at the company. And then his, um, the deliverable that came back to the institution was sort of threefold. He had to present his, his um, findings to the faculty and his department. The curriculum has to be changed within the next year to incorporate something that he learned. And he went back to the company and, and did a debrief for the company as well. And um, w the biggest benefit was that he was still on, he, he wasn't, he was being paid for out of our budget, not from the company. So we called it a faculty field experience. And, um, my next goal is to get teams of faculty members out like that. I'd like to have three faculty members from the same department in three different companies over the same period of time so that they could get a broader, deeper experience. I mean, quick follow-up. If I understood you correctly, the, uh, one of the outcomes of this is that you, whatever experiences they have at the company, they bring back and that then becomes incorporated in classwork, right? So that's, that's a, it seems to be a great way to show this uh, this quality improvement activity that, that we're all being uh, asked to show. So I, that's, to me, that's intriguing. I like that. I, I believe in DeVry also there's a large faculty development initiative. And how do you fund that within the DeVry system? Well, at one time, we had something called an industrial sabbatical. And uh, the person would uh, become employed uh, in industry for, say, a semester at a time and it would be paid by the industry, and if there was a salary differential, we would make up the difference. Uh, I don't think we have anyone on that right now uh, that, that I know of, John. It's a 50-50 shot. You send your faculty members to industry for 15 weeks. You have a good shot of them not coming back. So. <laughs>
we got a lot back, and they got that industrial experience, but we lost some business too. But uh, we were doing that for, uh, because it was so hard to find faculty, we were doing that for faculty who had just graduated, maybe with a master's degree or a couple of years, and not a lot of practical experience. So we would send them out to get that practical experience, and they'd say, hey, you know, I really like this. I think I'm going to stay here for a while. So they did. So industry gained, but we gained as well, because some of the people who came back were, had that recent. I, I just wanted to say one thing. It's, uh, we want to capture the discussion as much as possible, so we want to make sure the microphone is passed along, all right? But thanks, John, sorry. We missed probably some of that discussion on the cameras here. But I believe we have a question. Uh, not a question, but just a comment or maybe more information on this faculty externship. We had the similar program also, but what we do is rather than during the semesters, we send faculty during the summertime uh, so essentially, we give them summer release time or summer pay to go and spend time in the industry. And in our case, what we have done funding-wise is, of course, college funding is used for that, but most specifically, Carl Perkins funding is used extensively for that kind of work. And one of the most recent tangible benefit that we received from this activity was uh, one of our faculty members spent the entire summer at a local uh, company which was his activities was primarily focused towards national implementations lab view program. And as a result of that, we were able to make more connection with national instruments. And now we are an established recognized training center for authorized training centers for, you know, for lab view program. So there are many different ways you can benefit from that. Yeah, for most of you, uh, summer would work, but uh, in our particular model, uh, our teaching uh, is year-round, so our summer semester is not any different than, than fall or spring. But so if I could just add in, we chose um, a regular semester specifically because I really wanted the faculty member to have a, f have a foot in two worlds. I, that was the goal, is for him to be at, a comp you know, at, at the company from uh, for a period of time during the day and then bring that immediately right back into his classroom in the afternoon or the evening and make that connect to that transfer of knowledge was immediate. So we do, I mean, that's the faculty, some of them do go out and get summer employment in industry. It, the externship and also it is for tenured faculty only. It was not for not tenured faculty members. One of the topics that is uh, very impo much important for two-year programs is accreditation. And uh, over the years, the number of accredited programs, in, at least the two-year accredited programs, had been a decline. And over time, we have uh, the two plus two model, we have always required that accreditation to go to the next two. And so what's your perspective on should institutions continue two-year accreditation? And I know the trend is that many, many institutions are considering the number of A through K and all these criteria that's required for accreditation, which is not any much less significant than a baccalaureate degree program, and you have a two-year program having to meet all of these requirements, and the same the enormous resources that are spent when it's a resource directly uh, related program, should we invest, or is this a trend that we are moving away from two-year accreditation, especially unless there's specialized accreditation for air conditioning or uh, in the industry-based accreditation. I'm talking about ABIT accreditation. So what's the trend? Is, should we go in that direction, or is there a trend that we are go going away from two-year accreditation altogether? Yeah, I'd like to say, I, I think what I'm seeing is the trend might be that schools are going away from it. I know ABIT's actively trying to look at schools with a smaller number of graduates to see if there's a financial burden, can be kind of a, some kind of release there type of thing. But again, it's got to be made clear to the two-year schools what's the advantage of having the accreditation. I, I know the philosophy at my particular institution. If there's an accreditation out there, we need to get it. So, I mean, and that's, that's pretty much the model. So, but again, um, it, is a, it is, like you're saying, Dushi, it is a big resource grabber. I am the outcomes person. I mean, to do that and then do all the other duties that I have, it's a, it's a big thing. Um, in my particular institution, we had reams of data and stuff like that. And to be visited by someone from a four-year school, 
is, and again, that's, that's part of it too. I think that's the fear sometimes at the two-year community college is that we're hoping that, and again, that someone comes in there and understands some of the other issues going around that I don't have necessarily an institutional research person that's doing all that for me. Yeah. That I don't have uh, admins that can help me out with particular things. So I, I just, I'd, I'd hope the trend is we need the accreditation because I think that it makes it easier, again, that, that follow through to the four-year schools, we need that. We need that connection. And that's one way to guarantee the programs. You need it for that reason, but I think it also drives excellence and continuous improvement. You need that external force driving you. Absolutely. Our biggest challenge is relevance of the curriculum. And an external evaluation, accreditation, how it's, it's, it's one part of a, a bigger process or larger, larger structure, but I, our ELT program is also TAC ABET accredited, and it is a huge resource commitment, but I wouldn't have it, I mean, I, I believe we, we value that greatly. Tom, do you have any comments from Penn College and Technology? Uh, from a four-year perspective, we, uh, we've not, uh, we've looked at TAC ABET, and we've also looked at NAIT, NAIT accreditations for different majors. But we've not looked at accreditations for two-year programs uh, because many of our uh, two-year programs uh, matriculate to four-year programs as well. Walt? Yeah, I, I, the program you talked about at Monroe Community College is, is I think, great. And, and there we happen to be three members of the, of the Board of Journal of Entry and Technology here, and we're going to put you on the spot and ask you to submit an article to it because I think it's a great <laughs> program. Okay. <laughs> I sure. You know, this issue of two-year programs, ABED accreditation all has been discussed, I don't know, for 25 plus years. Um, and at least for 15 years, I've been talking about this issue of uh, the problem with two-year program accreditation. And I think the question is, folks who are on ABET board, uh, TAC of ABET, and all of these you know, boards have to decide what is it they want from two-year colleges and two-year colleges have to decide why ABET is of value. I have to tell you, I, you know, our programs have been accredited since mid-70s. Other than the fact that Boeing Corporation has a co company-wide policy that they only deal with institutions that are ABET accredited, and be because we are ABET accredited, we are listed as one of their you know, so-called qualified institutions where they provide grants and things like that. No other company ever asks us whether our program is ABET accredited or not. We do that simply for our own feel good, our own quality improvement, whatever you call that. Uh, the question of numbers and the cost and all of that is, so is very clear. I think what you need, especially for four-year folks and people who are on the ABET Tech Commission all do, need to understand, when you accredit a four-year program, whether it's mechanical, electrical, civil, and so on, in many ways, you are accrediting a department because four-year programs are, in most cases, are department itself. So all the activities that go on are based on a department chair, a series of five or six or seven faculty, and, and there are some exceptions, but it's there. So I think if, you, if ABET is serious about involving more two-year colleges, ABET may have to think about its uh, philosophy, its mission for accreditation and maybe start thinking about, rather than program accreditation at two-year level, looking at departmental accreditation for two-year level. Because in many colleges at two-year level, you have many activities that go on. They are all interlinked. It becomes almost difficult to define where activities in mechanical ends and electrical begins and so on. But we can easily demonstrate to ABET or any other agency what we do as an institution, what we do as a unit in a two-year college that meets the need of the business and industry, how we improve quality overall, and so on. So the point is that ABET will have to rethink what is the primary mission of ABET. Is it accrediting programs or also looking at accrediting departments? I was really curious about your comments about curriculum nimbleness. You know, a couple of different things come to mind uh, as I sit back here and think about that, ranging from 
uh, ability to quickly respond to other things employers want, to changes in student learning modes, to uh, ability to tweak a single course versus integrated parts of curriculum. Uh, I was curious if you might share an example or two or if you might want to comment further on what it means to you when you say our curriculum is nimble. I can sort of give you an example um, coming from our optics area. In Rochester, I have a degree, we have an associate's degree program in optical systems technology. The primary purpose of that program, it has evolved into essentially a transfer program. But what we have in terms of optical uh, companies in the area, we have a strong core population of companies that do optical manufacturing and they needed optical fabrication skills. So we, using this model, we were, we were able to put together a certificate program very quickly in optical fabrication. It essentially is a tooling and a precision machining, some precision machining courses with some optical fabrication courses embed, uh, embedded into a certificate program that has less than 30 credit hours in it. But that, but those optics courses also feed into the optical systems technology degree program. There's, you know, it's fully transferable, and the precision machining courses, a student could still go the precision machining route if they wanted to. Another example of that is we had a small cadre of companies that were really clamoring for sheet metal fabrication, for example, and we were able to, with their help bring in, uh, bring in uh, the equipment that we needed to put sheet metal fabrication, a course. And one of the ways that we're able to do this is each of the degree programs is developing a special topics course in the degree program. And the special topics course could be a technical elective. And that special top, the content of that course can change from semester to semester without having to access the whole SUNY system. I don't know how many SUNY schools are here, but the SUNY system is, Law is complex when it comes to changing degree programs and changing curriculum. But if we put a special topics course in there, that enables us to put to change the content of the course from semester to semester. So that's one way that we do that. Yeah, I'd like to add at uh, County College of Morris, we do all our programs have a special topics. Uh, we're basically an Autodesk, AutoCAD house. Uh, Picatinny also is very much pro E. And we were able to add a special topics just on Pro E. Again, I mean, it's just a, it's basically it's a seasonal course. We're able, and again, we do count on adjuncts to come in, have that specialization to be able to teach that course. We had the software. Actually, Picatinny was able to give us three of their licenses at that time. And this was years ago. We ran it as a special topic. Since then, we've created a uh, design course that kind of runs, and depending on the students, they can either choose to do Inventor or they can do Pro E. In small, in small projects. So again, that was something directly uh, driven by, by a local employer. And we were able to quickly adapt to it and jump, jump on the bandwagon. If I could add just one more thing. Another thing that is a enabling us to do, f to be um, nimble, flexible, responsive, and sustainable, so there was four components to that, is project-driven courses because you can be working on an electrical project, a mechanical project, an optical project, construction project. But e even so, you're going to have interdisciplinary teams of students and faculty and representation from industry coming in and working on those projects. You can put, what we found is we can put an awful lot into those project-driven courses because you teamwork obviously needs to go in there, resource allocation, um, manufacturing assemb and assembly processes, uh, lots of things go into project-driven courses. So it's another tool that enables us to have a um, nimble curriculum. Associate degrees typically have been highly specialized type of degrees. They really focus very narrowly in a particular area and you get a lot of training in a particular area. But there's also this trend that associate degrees are becoming general education, much broad based. And it was never, that was something that was a no-no in associate degree particularly. You don't want to go there. You're highly specialized, that's your niche, and that's where you should be. And I know that I have heard discussions today that it could be broader. 
I know that there are markets probably pulling you in one way or the other because of the needs out there. Can we comment about should we remain focused because there are many associate degrees that are currently focused that are declining in enrollments and they're deciding where do we go next? Do we shut it off completely or do we reshape them? I'd and say so, you go into your industry and ask them, ask them and, resp and respond in whatever way they tell you to. I, th I, th I think it was added several times during the day, this whole thing of our first semester course is pretty much for the electronics and the mechanical. It's very much a common core. I, and, and again, it was, a, it was more of a about nine, ten years ago that the low numbers, we had to do something. So that was part of it. Um, and since then, I mean, again, and it was it, actually the industry kind of said it that it really, um, I've had EETs hired by pharmaceutical companies to do process technology. Basically, again, they were, they were counting on this person to be able to document things. They weren't anything that they were looking for electrical traits. The mechanicals have been hired by all kinds of different industry um, in the area. So again, the skills of writing, thinking, innovation, I mean, and then, you know, down the line, somewhere in there, there's some, something specific is, is gone away. So we need to adapt our programs, and it's worked out that this common core um, and it's a mix of electrical mechanical courses. Um, all the electricals take the CAD class, so everybody's taking CAD. Um, and again, I, I, I think it's worked out well. Um, you know, and then the specialization comes towards the second year type of thing. So, Tom, do you have anything like that? We, we have uh, we have a core requirement of about 12 credits of general education, but uh, the philosophy of of the curriculum at Penn College has been to put the students in the specialized areas as soon as possible. That's one of the attractions for students is that they come here in their very first semester. If they're in uh, electronics class, they're in electronics and in, in, in laboratories. Or uh, if they're in construction, for example, they're, they're taking construction courses in the labs the first semester. So uh, we've tended to, spe to, to stay specialized in that sense. I know DuBois has a lot of credits for associate degree, so you want to elaborate yeah, a little bit me, about that? Let me, rather than uh, address that, first let me just say that uh, we have biomedical engineering technology programs, and one of the problems, as I see uh, with that program, uh, is retaining the interest of students because we don't do what Tom does. Uh, they have their uh, biology and anatomy and physiology and so forth early on, but it's really uh, what would be the first semester of the junior year before they get a biomedical engineering technology course. And we find a lot of students losing interest in the field because they don't get into that. So we're talking about uh, you know, moving some biomedical uh, specific courses. Uh, but uh, I guess uh, one of the things that I, you know, I proposed when I was talking was uh, uh, perhaps what you mentioned was uh, a more general associate degree and then uh, specialize maybe at the baccalaureate level. So, but that's just, you know, I'm not saying yeah. uh, from experience, I'm just saying that's something to think about. Abby? Um, Abby Agaire again from Drexel. Uh, I know that uh, at Drexel we have uh, partnerships with two-year schools where we actually go there and, and offer the programs. Our faculty go to the two-year schools. For example, we have Drexel at BCC, which is Burlington County Community College. And uh, I don't, I will, the question I have for you, do you have any partnerships like that with four-year schools in, in your area where the schools actually come to your school and they have their flag and, you know, uh, in your school and they offer their courses right in your school uh, because we have that uh, with the Burlington County Community College? As you might imagine, with an institution with 19,000 students, um, within an hour and a half of my office, there are about 27 institutions of higher education in uh, Rochester, New York. So our 19,000 students are attractive to every single one of those institutions, and they would all love to be on our campuses offering the second two years of a degree program. And um, we, do in, we do work with some, we, we have, we have official structures where colleges can, and can come and rent space from us and offer their degree programs. I guess to answer, so I hope that answers your question. Yes, we do work in partnership with colleges to do that. But we're a community college and you've got representation from different types of institutions here on the board. So when, I, when you ask, you know, should, it, should an associate's degree special, be specialized or should it be general? 
you have to ask, I think, what's the purpose of the associate's degree? What's its primary, what are you trying to do with it? For us, um, as I mentioned earlier, of those 1,500 companies, 97% of them have less than 100 employees. And what we're trying to do is be responsive to them. And so what they told us was, we want technicians that have deep and broad skill sets. So what we are trying to do is, diff is create a, a curriculum that enables us to do that in a sustainable way that, with, that we can afford to do. Yeah. And they want that in two years. Of course they do. <laughs> and they want to pay you know, $12 an hour for it. And they want them to, have, to be global citizens and all of that. But that's the reciprocal part, because I say to them, yeah, but you can't get them for $12 an hour. Because see that company over there? They're going to pay $17 an hour for them. So that's the reciprocity part of it. And it actually benefits our students. And the program has to be accredited. Absolutely. Right. Our problem is that the, uh, we, we try to fit too many things into an associate degree. There, there, there's a bloat in the sense that a lot of our two-year associate degree programs are 72, 74 credit hours now, and faculty really struggle when new things come along. What do we remove? So that's, that's, a, question. that's a constant issue. That's a so, constant question. Yeah. We, have, excuse me, we, we have the same problem with our associate yeah. degree, even though it's not an engineering technology program, it's 71 right. credits. Absolutely. And the first thing the faculty say is, well, what do you want me to take out? And um, the response is not, what do you take out? My response back to them is, I, I need to know if, if there's something sacrosanct about your lab, if it is the only place that learning can happen. Or can learning happen someplace else? Can those objectives that you're trying to get across to your students, can they learn that someplace else? Can they learn that in a capstone project? Can they learn that on the job? Can they learn that in somebody else's classroom? Because we certainly do not uh, add credit hours. Our, certif our associate's degree program are between 69 and 70 credits. Um, if you add one additional credit hour in New York State, it is a long, drawn-out process. But I don't think it is a question of what we take out. I think it's a question of, is there another venue that can be utilized to teach this subject? Sometimes the answer is, absolutely. Um, my, you know, it has to be in this laboratory setting, et cetera, et cetera. But sometimes it is, well, maybe it could be learned in a cooperative learning environment if we structured it the right way. Or it could be learned, you know, taught online or in a hybrid format or, 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 or. I, I, I'm sorry. I just, I, real quick, Abby, just in NGIT, I know with us doesn't do their upper level courses at our particular campus. We're only about 20 miles away from NGIT. They do do it down in um, Brookdale, which is almost what? Uh, 40, 50 miles away type of thing. So that's a different scenario. I don't know if you're familiar with the New Jersey NGIT model. They were originally just strictly junior and senior year. I mean, junior and, and the fourth year type program. They have since added the first two years. And one of the, the threats I, I guess I put up there was a competition for the same number of students. And that was really a concern when they first uh, initiated that, that we'd be competing with the same pool. But um, again, they're kind of looking at it as really not competing with the community colleges, but trying to give an avenue for the engineering science students that are already in their programs there and have an avenue that they might be able to then move into the engineering technology programs. But I think it's more of a, whether they go on, we do this with other four-year schools. We allow them to teach courses on our campus. I'm, I'm, again, I think your question referred to the years beyond the associate. Um, and that's certainly, and actually we've had other combinations with some schools where we can go up to 90 credits. They still graduate with an associate's degree. They can still do 90 credits on our campus with a criminal justice degree and then just continue that basically the last 30 credits at the home institution. So we've, we've done more and more of that, which is an interesting model. Tom? I'm Tom Hall, and I'm the chair of the Engineering Technology Council, and I actually ask for the floor for just a couple seconds at the end of this session to make a couple comments and to put in a plug. I mean, the first thing I would like to say is, is that uh, Dushi and Ron have put together an absolutely fantastic program here. It's, it's, uh, it's really been outstanding. I'd, I'd like to give them a hand right quick.
Tom, I thought you were going to ask a very tough question here, and I was shivering in my pants here. No, not, I don't have any tough questions. <laughs> but, but, and, uh, well, my students think so sometimes. But, uh, and I also uh, am glad that uh, Renata Engel is here as president-elect of ASWE to hear the issues that we've been talking about. Now, because she's from Penn State, she's probably heard a lot of this already, but uh, it, it's very important that we understand that what we've heard today from industry and government, from the deans of the four-year schools, and, and from the two-year schools are issues that we've been talking about for how many years, Larry? A whole bunch, a whole bunch of years. Uh, at, and what I wanted to do is put in a plug for the next session and the one first thing in the tomorrow morning, because uh, Bob Herrick and, and Mark Pagano, and of course Mark, uh, Mike O'Hare, who's, who's had to leave, I uh, have then been doing this national ET forum, and if anybody can resolve some of these, it's going to be these guys. Uh, and the, the key we all understand is bringing industry in, into this. And we've been able to engage CMC effectively. We hope we can continue to move forward and maybe get some resolution on some of these issues that you've heard. And, and I, again, I want to thank uh, Ron and Dushi for putting this together and all the presenters for what they've had to say, because, because we've been talking about this, now it's time to do, right? Okay, thank you, appreciate it. All right, any other questions? By the way, we'll hear from Renata at the dinner time, so I'll keep that for the time being. Uh, if you don't have any other questions, maybe I'll finish a little early so that we can have a little bit more time outside, and uh, I know that we probably, uh, the reason is that we had allocated certain time, assuming there were going to five panel members, but obviously we lost a few in our way of trying to get this program organized. So we're going to still meet here at 345. That's the next session begins. So we just have a little extra time here. So thank you. Thank you for the panel.